Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Paul Adepoju, and I'm the Community Manager for the ICFJ's uh, Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. And uh, we are glad to have a conversation today that is also focused on uh, a major crisis that is global in nature. And um, in a couple of days, uh, it's going to be the main attention of most reporting across the world. I'm talking about climate change. And uh, why is this uh, conversation that is aimed at uh, helping journalists uh, that are interested in pitching climate change related stories important? Uh, the reason is because uh, considering the enormous nature of climate change reporting, the several issues, the various layers that are involved, it's easy to be overwhelmed and uh, and uh, struggle, struggle to figure out how best to pitch stories, what stories to pitch, even when the idea is really great or you have content and substance to write a very good story. Uh, this may be difficult for you to do if you don't have uh, enough uh, insight on how to do it. And this actually brought uh, something interesting to my mind. I remember on, on Sunday, uh, I signed my own week in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, why, why, where I went to attend uh, an H a HIV conference. And um, during the conduct, I remember that uh, almost a year ago, I was in the same hall uh, for COP26 and uh, having to run up and down, uh, chasing story leads, who to interview. I, by the time I assessed uh, the kinds of stories I was able to write uh, from the experience, I realized that if I had, um, some guidance from an editor and insights on how, what to actually focus on. The experience might have been less stressful for me and uh, probably I would have been able to write much more impactful stories. And that's the goal for this session today in which I will be talking to an editor uh, that is uh, well positioned to help you make better sense of it. So allow me to introduce our guest for today. Uh, his name is Greg Mott, and uh, Greg Mott is currently the Sustainability Editor at Politico. Hi, Greg, how are you doing today? And thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to, and, and to talk with you all. Yes, uh, if you don't know who Greg is, uh, Greg, uh, uh, even though he's uh, currently with the political, uh, he joined uh, political from uh, Bloomberg News. Uh, at Bloomberg News, he was crucial in shaping financial regulation coverage at uh, these outlets for more than 14 years. Uh, during these 14 years, he was involved in uh, covering uh, global cri economic crisis and uh, in rewriting the event that wrote US financial regulations, in addition to several other upheavals in the industry. Even before he went to Bloomberg, uh, he was a longtime editor at um, the prestigious Washington Post, and um, and this culminated in a coordinating role on its uh, on the uh, newspaper's uh, healthcare team. Uh, he's also a longtime member of the National Association of Black Journalists in a, and the National Press Club, uh, which is why we are really thrilled uh, to have him join us today. So let me start with. Uh, what really, really uh, would be uh, your personal interest as an editor? Uh, what kind of story, climate change related story, pops at you that you are always excited about to, uh, well, to see pitches, to receive pitches on? So it's interesting. It's interesting that the topic that we're talking about here is climate change, which is obviously something uh, that's very much at the center of all of our attention nowadays, and, and rightly so, because you know the, the impact on the entire planet. So obviously a global issue of uh, almost unequaled importance. The, the approach that I take as, as a sustainability editor at Politico and in, as overseeing our uh, ESG coverage, environment, social, and governance coverage is the much more interesting stories today are not stories that tell us how bad things are, right? Like, like I think we've done we've done and seen enough reporting uh, over 
recent years, especially in recent years, I mean, this has gone on for a long time. I can remember even as a, as a child, like the, the, the sort of nascent uh, reporting on the uh, impending environmental crises go all the way back to the 1960s, 1970s. So over that time, there's been a lot of reporting on how bad things are. What an editor like myself wants to see is story pitches and stories about what people are doing about it. So we're much more focused on what, especially in my role, uh, we are much more interested in what are the solutions, whether these solutions are coming from, from corporations or governments or NGOs or individuals even. So I think the kinds of stories you wanna be on the lookout for at COP and other places is stories about novel thinking and novel approaches in response to climate change. Yeah, that's quite uh, helpful and that's quite uh, topical. But um, I will, uh, luckily and luckily I was at COP26, so I'll be talking from a really, really practical perspective. Do you think that is the kind of story you can get at COP27, considering the fact that uh, the most at best what you'll be looking, getting, would be insights on the debate, deliberations, how bad things are getting, and a little or no focus on solutions. So how do we balance this with the reality of a COP event? Well, you know, so it's interesting because in the run-up to COP26, one of the things that the early reporting is uh, COP27, uh, the early reporting is, suggestion, is suggesting that not a lot is going to happen at COP27, right? But looking back at COP26, and one of the things that we became very interested in and are still almost a year later trying to get our arms around is the, the whole, the, the what are uh, GFANS, like so the, the global, the corporate alliance, uh, aimed at addressing uh, emissions around. So uh, it's things like that. It's also like the whole idea that the UN is sort of over, sort of uh, in, endorsing this group put together by Mark Carney to bring financial companies and others together uh, to work together, work, work jointly on reducing emissions, slowing climate change. Um, I think things like that are interesting. I mean, I think so to the extent that you could you you can suss out things like that. Uh, I think you can, the pitches can be built around that. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, to our audience, our participants, we really want. I really want to throw the gates open to you today, and uh, allow you to directly engage with Greg uh, on this issue. So. Um, I would rather like you to speak, uh, if you can raise your hand so that I can activate your mic and you can directly uh, ask your partner, ask Greg your partner questions. I, we already have some hands raised already. Like, uh, like we said, uh, today is less about uh, presentation and more about talking. My great friend, Michelle, you have the floor. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Oh yes, you're loud and clear. All right, um, thank you for what you're doing. I just wanna appreciate you and um, uh, your, your host right there. I think you made valid points with uh, looking at, you know, stories that highlight what people are doing, um, you know, as regards climate change from the government to private corporations. Uh, but you know, something that I find challenging with, with that is the, openness and the willingness for these people to actually make the required changes on climate change crisis. And I say that because I'm, I'm here in Nigeria and the conversations around climate change isn't being drummed enough, more so because of the body language of the government. And right now people aren't really doing anything as regards climate change at all. So it's gonna be very difficult to, to highlight those things that encourage people are doing. From our situation here in Nigeria, people still do not understand what climate change is about. People do not even believe what climate change is about. Um, so the, the pitches that might come from journalists in Nigeria, for example, to be very realistic, will probably not be about what people are doing to support or contribute to uh, so stop climate change. 
it might still have to do with the awareness and the causes and the crisis and reporting on how it's affecting lots of businesses, the economy, agriculture, and so on uh, at the moment. As regards climate change, the government is in ready, unfortunately. As regards COP27, they're looking to, you know, ask for funding, but it's very unclear what these fundings will go for, uh, particularly. So I think that's another angle that uh, Nigerian journalists can look at. Should Nigeria secure funding from the international community on uh, climate change to help, you know, with the climate change crisis? I think journalists should be more... Um, to, to scrutinize the government on what these funds are going to be used for. Are we going to be planting more trees? Are we going to cut down on some emissions? Are we going to clean up the environment? What are these things? Just to touch light what these funds are going to be used for. Uh, the, the more we, we press on these particular um, funding financial flow, I think that would be better for us at the moment. Uh, but as for what people are doing, individuals, I don't think much is being done at the moment, if anything. People are still not waking up, even though there's flooding here in the country. Yeah. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Greg, do you have a response no, to that? So ab absolutely, thank you very much for, for that, Michelle. And you're absolutely right that the, that the one thing, it's so if Nigeria is going before the world and asking for money to address climate change, well, yeah, the story to pursue there is, what are you gonna do with the money, right? Uh, and unspoken in what I said, uh, when, when I when I mentioned the idea of solutions, like writing, pitching stories and writing stories around solutions is, yes, what are people doing and what are people not doing, uh, right? That, so that's also a story. Like if you have a country like Nigeria, uh, where where the, the effect, the effects and impacts of climate change are already present, and at the same time, you have a company that is uh, a, 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 a major producer of fossil fuels. <laughs> it's like, yeah, what are, what are they not doing and why, uh, I think is worth examining. But yes, that, the idea you mentioned about finding out about the money that they're seeking and what they're seeking the money for, I think, is, I think that's, uh, that's, that's a worthwhile pursuit. Yeah, we're going to ask to Monisa. Monisa, you have the floor. Yeah, hi, Paul, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I am from Kashmir. Uh, it is in India, and uh, I really resonate with what Gregory has been talking about or what Michelle particularly spoke about, because in our part of the world, uh, you know, there has been a conflict in place for some decades, and that has been the mainstream issue for all these years. And as uh, such, issues related to environment or climate change have really taken a back seat. In fact, people generally have this perception that probably climate change is a foreign phenomenon or it's a problem that other countries have to deal with and we necessarily don't have to kind of witness it. But what we have seen here, you know, we have Himalayas around us and uh, there is a phenomenon that uh, I and, uh, you know, few of my journalist friends have been observing, which is that people who are working on environment or particularly on glaciers, for example, they have been saying that the glaciers are melting at a faster pace. And this issue has been covered in certain you know, websites or um, different agencies where some of the journalists have pitched their stories. But as such, it is not something that has trickled down to the grassroots. Or if you look at the weather or even larger climate here, for example, the uh, you know winter has set in like a couple of months before only. Uh, we didn't see much of snowfall last year. Otherwise, it would snow like multiple times during winters, during the months of maybe December, Jan, and until uh, March. So there is some kind of variation and there's an impact on wetlands also. Now, uh, sorry to be slightly longer, but what I intend to ask is because we are interested in pitching some stories around these issues and actually highlighting from this part of the world as well, which has been in news for other issues, but not necessarily about you know environment. So what kind of stories uh, may editors like you be interested in? And how can we kind of you know navigate through the pitch uh, stage? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Take that, uh, Greg. I also have a follow-up question on that. 
Okay, so I do think so. I because I'm based in the U.S. and because I live in an environment where these issues have been prominent for so long, uh, I may have a different perspective than a reporter in Nigeria or in Kashmir or or anywhere on the the uh, the subcontinent. Uh, because right, if if you are if you're pitching stories in a place where these issues uh, have not uh, resonated, uh, then I think if if you're pitching those stories locally, then then I think sometimes you do maybe need to do the sort of fundamental educational reporting that's that 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 is law, that's been done. Like we no, we no longer need to do that here because. Anybody who isn't aware of climate change in the U.S. Uh, is, I mean, I don't. There, what can you do to reach people who haven't gotten the message so far? I, I've said with respect to uh, sort of environmental protests in our country, at least, that I think that a lot of environmentalists have the misimpression that what they need to do is they need to yell at us louder. Right and uh, and but I don't but I think what they're not recognizing in some cases is that no you don't need to yell louder because people have heard you and some of them disagree uh, and so part of the part of the mission of journalists I think is uh, to sort of enlighten people who disagree. I mean, I, to to find increasing evidence that yes, th that uh, there is a problem, and there are ways of addressing the problem that you should be considering that you're not considering. That's when when I when I talk about solutions, that's really what I'm talking about. That that uh, y that yeah, everyone is aware, even if you're not aware of it in in terms of climate change, right? If you don't know what climate change, if, you, if you've never heard of climate change, you've never heard of global warming, uh, and you're a person of a certain age, you will definitely know that the environment that you live in has gotten worse over time, right? That storms seem more frequent, that, that flooding is more frequent, that, 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 that you know, major cataclysmic events are occurring more often than they're used to, that things are that places are hotter than they used to be. Like I'm I'm older than most of the people on this call, and and one of the things. So I'm from uh, the northern part of the United States, and what I can remember is that when I was a kid, it was very rare for the temperature to rise above 90 degrees in the summer, and now it's fairly routine in that part of the country. <laughs> 90 degrees Fahrenheit, because I know I'm talking to a global audience here, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but it's a real thing. I'm clearly the place where I grew up is a lot warmer now than it was when I was a child. And it's not my imagination, <laughs> right? I mean, and so I, I do think, yeah, I think, yeah. So again, if, if you're in places in the world, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of an editor in the United States of America, where these issues have been discussed for a long time. And if you if you're not aware of the issues, it's because you're not you're you're tr you're either trying not to be aware of the issues, or you're sufficiently ignorant that no amount of communication is going to get through to you. Uh, but yeah, there are places in the world where I where I think you would have to amend what I say because probably more education is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So we have um, Christina Costa and uh, Ines Simon on the line. Uh, I wanted to go back uh, back and fourth. Christina, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm unmuted. <laughs> I'm not sure. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, so where are you joining us from? And that was a question uh, from... Well, I'm, uh, I'm in Lisbon currently, and I'm Portuguese, but I wrote a lot in German and in Germany, and in English too. Um, so I'm based currently in Lisbon. I, I think there's another one, which is there for Andrea from um, Azul, a supplement in Publico, and that's exactly why, I, uh, after hearing this good insights from Greg, I would like to pose the question. It's true. Um, I've, activists are getting a little bit, 
I've been as journalists, let's say it like this, uh, frequently faced from friends which are activists, like you are not covering uh, the story in a proper way. So my question would be really, um, is there maybe really a kind of media bias we are um, experiencing so that not only the activists are, are, are yelling louder, but uh, we journalists are not uh, building really the right bridges between what we traditionally would say is the blue economy and the green economy, because there used to be such a division. And now with climate change issues, it doesn't make sense. Um, so how could you research topics like that? Because the issue is global and, um, and it's, it has to be, in, but this is my opinion, it has to be um, transmitted to people from bottom to top and not the other way around. And I have still the impression that the media in general uh, is still treating the topic as a niche. Okay. Simon, do you want to go back? Uh, do you also want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I am Inez. I'm based in London. And um, of course, we're near Europe uh, or in Europe, continental Europe. And there is obviously a lot of conversation around the energy crisis and how governments are trying to solve for that and meet people's energy needs this winter and a lot of what's happening we're seeing a return to fossil fuel use revamping oil facilities and coal facilities so you know the implications of hosting a cop at the moment are quite interesting and I'm curious from an editorial perspective what kind of stories within that you know how the energy crisis is going to affect negotiations let's say what kind of stories do you think are worth looking into even though this might be a small cop where not much happens, it is still an interesting time to be thinking about climate change and solutions when so many governments are turning in the short term, at least to uh, traditional energy sources. Well, you know, yeah, so- uh, Yeah, we'll take a pause and uh, Greg will take both questions. So uh, to the second question first, it's interesting. I, I was actually at a meeting with, uh, with an, a, a top executive from a very big financial institution yesterday, as a matter of fact. And uh, he said something that, uh, and he may have been aware of this, uh, that was very much reflected in, uh, and I don't, I don't know if everybody around the world has seen uh, this IEA uh, reporting today that the New York Times and Wall Street Journal are both reporting that uh, rather than uh, slowing uh, the energy transition, um, the the war in Ukraine is likely to accelerate it, and this is very much the the thing that this banker the, this banker is in charge of uh, sustainability stuff. Uh, he's not a banker; he's a financial institution guy, but he's he's responsible for his company's involvement in the in the in ESG investing and in the green transition, and so I didn't, and again. Everything I've heard, I don't know exactly, I can't really speak to COP27 in terms of specific story pitches because the reporters that I've spoken with are all of a mind that they don't really, they don't know what's going to happen. They, they I mean, they, they don't really have a great sense of what the main storylines will be. But I do think, and whether whether the the negotiations will be affected by the war in Ukraine and, and the, the, the sort of uh, consequent uh, energy crisis, obviously, they, I mean, of course they will, right? I mean, <laughs> the, the Europeans are major players in, in, in these, these organizations, in these talks. And so they're living with the reality of facing a winter with energy shortages based on their existing, existing reliance on fossil fuels and fossil fuel producers. Uh, and so, yeah, I, it will obviously be at the front of everybody's minds as they're, as they're in, engaged in these discussions. But as far as specific story, I don't really have a great answer for you in terms of specific storylines that might emerge from that. I did want to touch on the on the the, the previous uh, questioners suggestion that there is when you when when you're saying that when you're talking about media bias are which in which direction are you thinking in terms of media bias against uh environmentalists or media bias against 
the other side. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm a- Yeah, yeah. If you can raise your hand again, uh, Inez, I think you already lowered your hand. Uh, okay, okay. Well, that, that, was, that, was, that was Christina's question. Yeah, Christina, you can- It was yeah, Christina, well. yes. It was not Inez, yes. it was Christina. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, currently I'm working mainly for a PR agency. I'm not going to tell which one. This is one of the biggest one, uh, ones in the world. It's also American origin. And um, that's why I see why, because the question makes sense. And what I mean is that we keep um, forgetting the topic as scientific issue in some ways. It's not um, that... Uh, what I don't mean is that there's a general disinterest of media to report on climate change. No, no, it's becoming a big, big topic, but it's treated like a PR topic and not um, in a niche way and not as a general topic in every topic. What I, what, what I would like to see as a journalist would be that climate change and cinema, climate change and uh, renting a horse, climate change and I mean now globally, not only this, oh, climate emergency, 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 because I think this is really uh, on one side, um, putting the discourse in a way that people are just alarmed and, and worried, which in the first time um, makes them read the stories, but on the other side uh, makes them not take the, the background serious, which then seems to reflect what activists are doing, because they're, of course, you're right, they, they have all the attention, but I followed COP uh, in Glasgow a little bit, I had the opportunity online, I was not present, and the real questions coming in particular from the countries which will be affected more, uh, like Africa, like uh, Oceania, they, they, they didn't play a big role. It seemed all to be like, okay, these people are crying, the Maldives are sinking, um, well, um, so um, let's just put it on money on, on the subject. Well, okay. I think that what people really want, and that's we have a lot of people present here from, from several, what we call underdeveloped countries. Uh, I don't like the term. Um, they want um, to be part of this change. And, and this has to be addressed also by leading media more and more. And, uh, and maybe this could be a place for story pitching. Um, that's that's the way I wanted to ask the question. I don't know if I made myself clear or no. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, yeah. Well, I certainly think if you if you have story <laughs> in 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 that direction, I I I I can't see why editors wouldn't welcome them. <laughs> I mean, I, I yeah, I think I and I think you're right. I do think we need to change the conversation in the direction that that you're talking about, so that it is sort of more present everywhere. Okay. But I, I don't know. I, I, I see that there's always only a local approach. The things I tried to pitch, um, at least in a European context, they were all like, oh, this is not local enough. And maybe oh. this is, is a kind of mistake. But maybe it's just a, a normal thing. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So we have a long queue already. So we'll go to Jane now, followed by Dokas and uh, Patricia and Simba. So Jane, you have the floor. Yeah, hi. Um, of course, editors always want new things. Um, I would like to know from Greg, are editors more interested in scientific innovations that may bring um, new su sustainable solutions or in new um, activist groups? Like here in Germany, we have OMAS for Future. So these are grandmothers for future. Um, so the opposite end uh, generation, um, opposite end of the age spectrum from the Fridays for Future school children. Uh, and of course, everybody's seen um, the sort of spectacular actions by Stop Oil. Um, which, of, which of these do you think is going to be more significant around COP27? Well, again, I, uh, like which, which is going to be more significant around COP27, I don't know that I can answer that question, but I can address, I can, I can certainly respond generally to the, uh, to the question by saying that we will always be interested in stories about scientific developments that are meant to address global warming and meant to address climate change that are meant to help foster 
the green transition. With respect to sort of, so the question that I would have if you're pitching me a story about a new activist group is, uh, is this activist group saying anything different than we've heard from a whole bunch of other activist groups? I mean, the, the fact that it might be grandmothers or little children or whatever is less interesting to me, and this is without knowing anything else, less interesting to me than whether they're, whether they're bringing something new to the, to the conversation. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll go to Dokas. Dokas, you have the floor. If Dokas is not ready, Simba, are you ready? Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so I'm Dokas Ekupe from Cameroon, and um, my question is um, on climate change. You know, I live in a region where um, year in, year out, sometimes you have temperatures that go up to 40 to Is Dokas still there? Simba? Shikanza, are you ready? Um, right, I'm um, ready in um, 10 seconds. You know, it's so to, to see new things, you know, and to be able well, to so write. Here's my question, folks. Thank you. Yeah, Simba, How Simba, wait. Uh, let Dukas finish our question, then we'll go straight to you. Just give us some minutes. Okay, Dukas, continue, please. Hello, Dukas. Oh, we lost Dukas. Simba, you have the floor now. Okay, thank you. Sorry, my, my device is playing up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. How, how would you, how would you uh, pitch a story, like in this case, where the government regularly, like from a position where the government regularly and officially announces from an understanding that the citizens are the ones who are guilty of causing climate change and officially unleashes the army for oh, more than 30 years, an example being Zimbabwe. I'm looking for an introduction to such a gory story. And I know this might sound new, but it is a phenomenon that's been happening since the 1980s where the citizens of a country of over 15 million people are officially blamed for causing climate change and the army must be unleashed on them. Gregory, I think uh, that would be a question for local researchers to provide the finding and journalists to report that finding. Uh, am I right, Gregory? I, yeah, I, well, I certainly think so. And, and I'm, I'm sort of curious as to what unleash what unleashing the army on on the population is meant to accomplish in a ter in terms of so the 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 population is accused of being responsible for climate change and as a result of that the army is unleashed on them how does that address climate change i don't i'm not sure i'm understanding what the what the point of I mean, I say as, as a citizen of the world, I, I understand the, the point of unleashing an army on the citizenry. That, uh, that's a story that's been told enough times, but I, I don't, I, I'm curious as to how it relates to climate change. Yeah, can Simba type that in, um, in the chat box and uh, we'll read it out uh, when you provide that clarification. Patricia, you are next, then we'll go to Frank. So Patricia and Frank, yeah, Patricia, you have the floor. Hello, thank you very much for, for organizing this. Um, Greg, uh, I have a question here. I'm, I'm based here in Chile. I cover, uh, of course, uh, Chile as well as uh, Latin America on, on energy and climate issues. And my question is really um, from a, a developing country perspective, uh, pitching into, um, into the developed world, to rich countries, to editors like yourself sitting in uh, in the U.S. 
the response is, well, that's too local. Um, or that's too sort of narrow or insular or, or um, you know, I, I wonder if you have any tips or suggestions to try to sort of grab the attention of editors to issues in, uh, in, in countries that are maybe far away from uh, the, the decision makers and yet uh, are the ones perhaps that are most suffering. And again, we've seen many stories with those kinds of themes um, but I wonder if you have any sp specific suggestions along those lines. I don't want this answer to, to seem flip because it, it could come off that way. But if you pitch a story to an editor uh, outside of South America, outside of the region that you cover, and the response is that it's too local, uh, there's a good chance that they're right. They, so, but that puts the onus on you to shape the pitch in a way. The question that I always want reporters to answer, whether it's a freelancer or whether it's the people who work directly under me, is at some point very near the top of the story, you have to explain why people my prospective readers of this story need to know what you're telling. Like what, like why, like a friend of mine used to say, unrelated to journalism, just if I was blabber, blabbering on about something, would say to me, why are you telling me this? That's, <laughs> that's the, so any, any freelance reporter, any, any, any writer pitching an editor has to be able to answer that question. That, I mean, so if you're pitching a story out of Chile to a North American publication, how does the thing that you're writing about relate to the audience of the publication you're pitching? And I'm sure that there, you, I don't think that you or any other good reporter would be pitching the story if you didn't think it had any resonance, but it's incumbent on you to convey that. You have to I think you should spend some time as you're preparing your pitch, thinking about why you're pitching it to the people you're pitching it to, because that's the answer to the question. I mean, and they still may turn you down, but at least you've answered that question. I mean, you've, uh, that, that's a fundamental question. And that gets not just with climate. I mean, in every, every area that I've worked in in my career, that question comes up and, I, and, uh, and very often, I mean, editors are busy people. So it's like, it, it, like if, if you have a story pitch that, that excites them, you will get their attention. And if you can't make it resonate with them, then, then you're not going to get a hearing. Yeah, if I can also uh, add to that, I used to also have that concern, you know, but there was a way that uh, one of the editors, one of my editors presented it to me that a journalist only cares about the story while the editor also looks at the story uh, uh, from the perspective of its relevance to the audience of that uh, media outlet. So uh, it's not just the editor that is standing in between you and your approval, but the fact that that story has to also be considered appropriate uh, for that audience. For instance, if the predominant audience of a news outlet is in Germany and uh, you are talking about a story uh, let's say uh, in Ghana, and um, you are not able to pitch it in a way that would be relevant and of interest to that audience perspective, then you may not actually have, uh, the editor may not actually be interested in it. So irrespective of how passionate you are about your story, it is also important for you to look at ways to make it uh, equally relevant and of interest um, to the readership of the media outlet. Uh, does, do you agree with me, Greg? Yes. The one thing I, as you were talking there, what it, what it made me think about is something that I used to say to uh, reporters that I still say to this day of the reporters, uh, which is that, so you're a reporter and you become interested in things, but what you have to recognize is that there's a big difference. There's often a very big difference between interesting and important. Like, <laughs> 
So you, you will, as a reporter, you will learn and you will know a lot of things. And some of those things are worth sharing with a broader audience. And some of those things are not. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Frank, are you ready for us? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Hello, yes, everyone. go ahead with the, go ahead with uh, the question. Frank. Yes, this is Frank from Malawi. Uh, my question is, what is it that we can do as a journalist after encountering that uh, there is a political interference in our covering issues to do with the environment, for example, and climate change. For example, here in Malawi, uh, I understand the political stability, the political nature has also contributed a, a lot to our uh, mainstream. Uh, what is it that we can do uh, when there is uh, political interference uh, in fighting against or keeping the climate change and the environment? Thank you. Well, that's a tough question, I think, Paul, in the sense that, so I, I sit here in the US where um, there is, sorry about that. There's a, I'm, there's noise in my background that I wanna let. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Why? No, why no, no, I want to. I, I want to respond to that because. Um, okay. The, it's sitting in the United States where there's very seldom sort of aggressive political interference in our work as journalists, and and you sitting in the UK, I think, have a similar experience. I know, and I don't know if Malawi is one of these places, but I know in a lot of places in the world that reporting on political interference, as, as, as the caller put it, can be dangerous, can actually be, can, can endanger your life. So I don't know that, you know, if, if, you feel, if you feel free enough to report on political interference, uh, then by all means pursue it. But I, but I, I'm not, and, and there, are very brave journalists all over the world who risk their lives in the pursuit of not just stories about climate change, but uh, on a whole range of issues. And I applaud those people, but I'm not someone who will sit here in, in the suburbs of Washington, DC and advocate that people risk their lives to, to report on climate change or any other issue. So there is no story that is worth dying for. Please, only those stories that you are safe enough to do. And uh, it's also a major uh, priority for us to at the International Center for Journalists. Your journalist safety across the world uh, should never be in doubt. I think, yeah, let's <laughs> take a deep breath from that and go back to, um, to some questions that we also have. Now, looking at um, looking at all these uh, global perspective that you have about it, who oh, I think we've not had well, our hands already raised again. Um, okay, I will we'll still take some live questions. And uh, so, if you're also joining us on the Facebook live stream and you have questions, please look at the chat box, the comment box under the video you are watching, and put those questions there. And we we'll also take uh, some of them uh, very soon as, as we are entering the last fifteen minutes of this session. And um, so, the question I now have is this: uh, looking at uh, the reality that um, not much. Uh, can be achieved uh, by the international community, especially at events at COP26, COP27, and despite the hype. Um, how do you think journalists, especially those that are not there physically or will be covering uh, virtually, can still be able to write up much stories? Wait, I was repeat. I, I, I blanked on the repeat the question. Yeah, so the goal is this um, we know promises are always made at COP events, and we are still going to get some promises. But journalists are expected to write hard, hard stories. And uh, for somebody that would not be there in person, but would only have to rely on virtual coverage, 
how can they still write good stories uh, that will still be uh, of top quality that an editor like you will be considering uh, to publish? Ooh, well, yeah. Um, or do you only want journalists that are in Egypt? What's that? Say again? Or do you only want journalists that are in Egypt? Can you consider stories from those that are not in Egypt and are still covering oh, the conference? Sure, actually? absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think the, the, the global pandemic has taught us uh, uh, one thing that it probably didn't need to teach us, which is that, you know, that we can do great work in a lot of different fields, uh, including journalism remotely. So I think, you know, by, by reaching out to the right people in response to the issues that are raised at COP27, uh, it doesn't matter where in the world you are. Like, I, I think you can reach the right sources and access the right resources in many parts of the world, almost every part of the world. So I don't think that, I don't think you have to be in Sharm El Sheikh to, to pitch stories uh, off the events that, that are occurring at COP. We have Khan, and Khan, would you like to ask a question live? Khan, your hand is raised. And um, so which means if you still have questions, we still have space for one or two questions. So just raise your hand and uh, you are going to ask Greg live, uh, your questions live. Then the next thing that I also want um, to, okay, Michelle is back. Okay, so we'll take Michelle and go back to Khan when Khan is ready. Michelle, you have the floor. All right. Okay, thank you, Paul. Appreciate you. I just want to quickly ask, uh, because you mentioned uh, reporters or journalists from Egypt. I don't know. I want to know if um, Politico would also accept pitches from Nigeria, from journalists in Nigeria, uh, because the issues here are very serious, I'm sure. The flooding issue has made global news, uh, international news as well, and many um, media houses locally here struggle for uh, bonds to actually go to these communities and bring live reports. We have the CNN, the BBC coming here to do reports, and local journalists cannot do that because they do not have funding from their organization or support from their organizations or editors to do that. And with journalists like myself who still try to make, you know, create new paths and do, do things outside of their organizations to still raise awareness and, and, and make sure people's stories are told, will Politico be funding or helping should we write pitches to Politico? Would Politico fund our stories and support local journalists here in Nigeria, given the crisis that is currently ongoing and uh, um, the, the risk that is posing and the fact that many stories are still untold about what's happening in Nigeria as regards to flooding, especially with the victims? Well, well, what I would say is that given the specific audience of Politico and Politico Europe, um, probably, not, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there's worthwhile stories uh, but I don't think Politico would be the venue for them. I think more, more sort of. I'm trying. I'm trying to think of the way to phrase it. I, but so Politico is mainly both Politico and Political Europe. The the core audiences for Politico and Political Europe are sort of policy decision makers, right? So governments and policy decision makers in Europe and in the US. So it, it's, I think it might be a harder sell for a story like that to a place like Politico, but I'm sure that there are news organizations uh, that, if I, that if I had some time to think about it, I could name some news organizations that would be great venues for those types of stories. Yes, thank you. And um... Okay, Haza is here. Haza, you have the floor, please. If Haza is not ready, we have a question that was sent in. Uh, so Greg, uh, the question goes thus. 
Uh, there are some major topics on climate change in Africa that editors for global outlets will be interested in for publication. I think you've touched part of it, but if you still want to expand it on this, you can do that. Um, as I've said, I mean, again, I don't, unless the issue touches on um, policy making in, in sort of in the, in the realms that Politico covers, it wouldn't be Politico, but I can imagine that, um, that there are certainly news organizations. Uh, well, I, for example, I would like the, the big news organizations in the United States, uh, the big, more general news organizations like the Washington Post, like um, the New York Times, uh, and, and others like that, uh, are certainly venues where stories like that uh, would be would be welcome. And it depends on the story too. I think if it's the right, it has to be the right story and it has to be told in the right way. But I think editors in those places are are very good at finding stories and working with reporters and developing those stories. Hi. Yes. Hello? Yes. Can I ask now? Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Azza Girgis. I'm an Egyptian journalist. And I want to ask about uh, the stories or the topics that we really need to focus on in the global south. Um, do you think more um, about low income families and cli uh, climate change? What do you think, uh, uh, what, what the major topics we really uh, need to focus on? And also, do you think we journalists need to get uh, more education about climate change, uh, more information on stuff like that, like doing um, more courses or even doing MA, masters or whatever, to really get well informed about the climate change and, and and these major topics, thank you. I don't I don't know about formal education in, in terms of like going to school and getting a master's degree in in climate science, but I would generally advocate for more education on the topics that you're covering uh, to sort of in, uh, improve your your knowledge and, and expertise in that area. Absolutely. And when you talk about the so, so coverage uh, of the global South, um, which I, I think comes up in this sort of, uh, I don't want to say lip service, like, you know, that, that, uh, that the global North certainly pays lip service to these questions surrounding the global South. I wonder, do you mean, uh, like, I'm wondering if, if governments in the global South are advocating for their lower income populations. Uh, I mean, that's a question from me, actually. I, 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 I sort of, I don't know the answer to that of question. No. I know that you say, of course, no. <laughs> uh, and so I do think, so, um, that is, and so that strikes me as being sort of a tough nut. Like if, uh, when when the global south is arguing with the global north about responsibility for uh, addressing uh, climate change, and rightly pointing out that you know that uh, that that the industrialized world has gotten a great head start on the global south. And is responsible for at least most of the emissions that are, you know, polluting the planet today. Uh, so shouldn't they be disproportionately responsible for addressing them? And this makes me sound like I'm politicking on one side of this, and I don't really mean to be. I think it's a legitimate question, right? And and so, yeah, I think I, I think there should be more reporting on it, and there should be more reporting on it from the global south, but it does concern me that the governments of those countries, to the extent that they're even arguing for it, they're not really arguing for it on behalf of the people so much as for the the financial benefit of the few. Is that, <laughs> I mean, I mean, and I, and I don't know if I'm wrong or right about that, but it 
But it strikes me that if they're not advocating for the, the, the futures of their, their people, uh, what, what are they arguing for? Okay, we Activate. go to Katie. Katie, are you ready? Hi, I'm here. Yes, you have the floor. Hi, Greg. Um, I um, just wanted to follow up on something that you said about, you know, you addressed um, reporting on COP27 remotely. Um, and I was wondering um, kind of the opposite, you know, if you're an editor sending reporters to COP27, um, what kind of added value are you expecting to see out of their stories um, while they're reporting from the summit itself? You know, are you expecting to see um, color about what it's like being there? Um, are you expecting to see more exclusive um, interviews? I, I'm, I'd, I'd love to know from your perspective what you'd be looking for from those reporters. Well, I don't really care about what it's like being there. <laughs> I mean, not, not, not really at all, um, but to the extent that, so, so Politico itself is actually sending at least two reporters, probably more than that. So we're sending two from the US and, I, and probably more from Europe to COP and what those, yeah, exclusive interviews and sort of exclusive insight on whatever negotiations are taking place, even though, again, I've talked to these guys and none of them seem to think very much is going to come from this at all. But that's the sort of thing we're looking for, like on the ground color. On the ground color might sort of inform a broader story that you're writing, but that's not the story. Okay, so probably the last question we can take now um, goes to us. I'm a reporter for an environmental radio station. What can I do in circumstances when governments seem shy to share data regarding climate issues? Um, in DRC, authorities in charge of climate prefer to keep silent and want us to ask questions at the UN instead. So what, are, what is your advice for journalists that are having this kind of difficulty? And I think it's also a familiar theme in several other developing countries. So yeah. By way you can, what advice would you give? So again, like being less familiar with the lay of the land in developing countries than in the West, we experience the same thing in the United States, right? In all areas. And probably the same thing happens in the UK where the government isn't going to tell you everything you need to know to do your job. But at least in the West, and, and this must be true in places like the DRC and elsewhere, uh, the government won't tell you things, but there are people who know what the government is. They know what the government is doing. They know what information the government has. And if you can access the right people, uh, that's a way to get the information. A, a, a very good reporter I worked with a, long, with a long time ago points out that, you know, the last thing you want to do in reporting is to walk through the front door. What, that is to say, to call up a government agency and ask if if you're doing your job as a reporter and again this is this may be different in other parts of the world but if you're doing your job as a reporter all you want the government to do at the end of the day is confirm or deny the information that you have gleaned from elsewhere right i mean so i don't know if that's a sufficient response to the question but that's how it but that's the way it works uh, in washington and new york and after in london I think you may be muted, Paul. Yeah, yeah. So I was just scanning our Facebook feed. I think uh, all the questions there, you've answered them. So what are your well, so as we wrap up here, so what are your what is your suggestion? What is your advice for journalists? Uh, and um, looking at COP26 and uh, probably summarizing uh, the insights you've gotten from the questions asked, and probably those that have not been asked, I think is too relevant for journalists to have at the back of their minds going into this very major event. Well, again, I, I think, you know, again, bearing in mind my, my initial recommendation, which was uh, to where possible, you want to be reporting about solutions, but I think I was also rightly chastised and corrected and like, 
and uh, so that I will say there are places in the world where you where I think that you still need to be conveying the message. There are a lot of places in the world where, where we still need to be communicating the message that yes, this is happening and we need to do something about it. Uh, I think yeah, the, the overall advice I would be uh, would would give is to uh, yeah, don't look so much to official government uh, views on these things because that, you know, I don't think that will always be helpful, but you want to be able to identify people in the know, uh, either on the activist side or on the, the government side or on the corporate side, who are aware of what's going on and willing to share uh, information on those things. So many thanks. Uh, thanks for that tip. Thanks for that advice. And um, thanks to every participant that asked the question, including those that we were unable to take. And um, we do appreciate the interest in our uh, series of uh, webinars leading up to COP27. And uh, very much appreciation goes to Greg uh, for doing this, uh, for agreeing to this format. And, um, also gaining insights from our forum members spread across the world. And um, like you rightly said, uh, if you are doing, uh, if you are just waiting for what the government tells you, that is probably not uh, going to get you the right commission, story commissions that you desire. But uh, it's really, really important for you to have relationships with uh, key interest groups and others that you believe can get you through a picture of the situation of things regarding climate change actions, response and activities, and uh, those insights that uh, officials may not want you to have. And that is where your unique story lies that will actually get you uh, that commission. And uh, COP27, uh, there is a lot of optimism uh, regarding it. And um, we are also excited that this is happening. And it is going to be the focus of our, of our webinars uh, leading up uh, to this main event happening next, week, next month uh, in Egypt. And I encourage you to endeavor to be a part of everything that we'll be talking about. And uh, yeah, and, and um, I hope uh, you've been able to gain uh, one or two things uh, regarding this and um, if you would like to know more about this forum and what we do please check out uh, the website for the international center for journalists at www.icfj.org and next week uh, we are having a special session that is in partnership with ijnet in which we'll be providing uh, they'll be unveiling a new resource that they have for you regarding the environmental reporting and we're also going to have a panel of uh, successful environmental journalists uh, in different parts of the world. So I encourage you to also be part of this. Come and ask your questions. And um, that will be happening just a day before um, COP27 officially kicks off in Egypt. And we also have a special live uh, COP27 event happening the week after. So please and please come around. Uh, let's have fun. Let's discuss. Let's pitch together. Let's improve our reporting skills on environmental reporting. And uh, if you are yet to be part of our Facebook forum, I encourage you to check us out and be part of our community, be part of our Facebook forum uh, by clicking the link uh, in the chat box that we have. I think Stella has already put it there. And uh, so please and please be part of our Facebook forum. It's the quickest way uh, for you to have access to all the information that I'll be sharing and all the resources. And I'm also looking forward to if you are writing anything on COP27 on environmental journalism, please and please uh, reach out with those stories. Uh, they may qualify um, for our story competition. And um, hopefully the next one that we'll be doing next month will be focusing on COP27 reporting. So please and please uh, be part of our Facebook forum and reach out when you have stories on this. And if you also have additional questions for Greg that you would like me to pass on to him, don't hesitate to reach out and I'm going to get your response. And on behalf of the International Center for Journalists, the team behind this, uh, Stella at the back end putting these things together. And um, our guest, I say thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Joining us from across the world, we appreciate it, whatever the time zone is over there. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Or good night if you're already going to bed. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
Oh, I'm still online. <laughs>